Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Neil Gordon, CEO of the Discovery Museums. The Discovery Museums inspire curiosity and love of learning through interactive discovery, hands-on inquiry, and scientific investigation. Neil comes to the Discovery Museums after 14 years of leadership at the Boston Children's Museum and previously worked in Boston City's government as the budget director. Neil has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Neil, for joining us today. Thanks. Good to be here. So that's a very interesting career transition from being the budget director, the person who really is the steward of mm -hmm. the Boston, uh, Boston City budget, of its financial stability, to being within a museum and then now the leader of the Discovery Museums. Yeah, it's a, kind of a circuitous uh, career path, I'd say. You're right. How did that happen? Well, you know, um, I started out uh, always being interested in issues that affect people and particularly children. And, you know, I was pleased when I was city budget director to have a role in playing in making choices about the allocation of resources. But after 14 years of, or 13 years at the city, it was time for a change. And I was attracted to uh, the role of children's museums in affecting uh, children's education, working with parents, uh, affecting early learning. And uh, it felt like a good, a good change, and uh, it's been a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful career move for me. When you originally came to the uh, Boston Children's Museums, were there particular issues that led you to be the right person for that job at yeah, that time? Yeah, the Boston Children's Museum was, was very uh, involved in changes to the education system, trying to have an impact on the quality of teaching, uh, thinking about professional development within the school system. And I was very interested in affecting, uh, affecting change within uh, the education system, so it was a great fit. Uh, but I was also interested in uh, a lot of the issues of um, uh, disparity among different groups of children. And again, the Boston Children's Museum was um, very involved in trying to reach out to children of, of all cultures and all economic strata uh, to have them uh, have the, the opportunity to, to visit something like a wonderful museum. So at that time, you were in dialogue with a number of different players within the city, and you were affecting policy and being affected by the, the problems that that uh, educators had uh, within the context of the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. And so your, your background in city government uh, must have been very useful. Well, it was, it was really useful because I had spent so many years working in the city that I, you know, I knew the neighborhoods and knew, knew the people. Right. And it was really a valuable resource to have to be able to draw as we were forming partnerships and collaborations with other organizations in the city who were ultra, also interested in the same type of issues. I mean, one of the most valuable and important things about the Children's Museum world and the Children's Museum movement is the fact that we tend to reach out and embrace other people who are working with, with children and families. Talk about the disparities that you observed exist in Boston and, and how that troubled you uh, and, and how you feel that museums, discovery institutions, and, and indeed the educational sector uh, should be addressing those disparities. Well, you know, the, the it's true of the museum field overall, and Boston was no exception, that uh, museum goers tend to be upper income. Right. Um, they tend to be, by and large, white. Um, they tend to be people who have spent a long, long time in this culture. So new immigrants, people of color, people with less means are less likely uh, to um, uh, visit a museum. In fact, there's a, a statistic out there that, that some people um, have cited that suggests that up, upwards of 40% of Americans will never museum, museum, visit any museum of any type in their whole life. Uh, so I think it's really important if people are going to become part of the, the society and have an opportunity to be inspired by um, the, the type of educational experiences you can have in a museum to make it available and accessible to all. And, and frankly, that, that involves a lot of different um, um, types of ways of working with people to make it feel more comfortable, more affordable, more welcoming. And I think those are the sort of key things that uh, I worked on in Boston, but I think we're, we're also very proud of the, what we do at the Discovery Museums. So talk about the, the Discovery Museums. Now you have two museums. Mm -hmm. So the Discovery Museum was founded about 30 years ago uh, by a, a former school teacher who thought, uh, you know, in sort of west suburban Boston, 
the kids really deserved their own children's museum. So he took a, an old 120-year-old Victorian house, created a children's museum. Five years later, it was so successful that he built another building uh, that was dedicated solely to science. So the Discovery Museums is kind of unique in that we are a children's museum first and foremost, but we have a very strong emphasis and background in science. So do you, are you still in the same two buildings? We are still in the same two buildings, but in fact we're, we're on the cusp of a, of a major expansion and renovation that'll, that'll double the size of our, our uh, facility. Is the Discovery side uh, focused more on younger children and their explorations? Um, and then the Science Museum is, is for older um, children and youth? Well, it's really, it's very interesting. I'm glad you raised that because a lot of people think, oh, well, older kids can't learn science, or older kids can learn science, but younger kids can. And I think one of the things we're working on is, is melding those two parts of our, right. our, of our history uh, and really emphasizing that science learning, the, the, the habits of science, start at very early ages. I think there's lots of good research to support that you know, preschoolers are very happy doing science. In our own institution, we used to tell people that our younger building was for kids up to the age of six, and the other building was for kids over the age of six. And in fact, four years ago when I started there, we took down the, those signs, we made both buildings equally accessible to all, and we find that the three and four-year-olds are completely happy in the science building. They're getting a ton out of it, they're enjoying it, their parents are enjoying it as well. Do you have a particular philosophy that you try to promulgate or do you, do you see it as a canvas in which these philosophies uh, interact with right. one with another? Well, the, I mean, there, I would draw a distinction in our field between children's museums and larger science centers. Um, you know, if you read our mission statements, there's a, a kind of a fundamental train that runs through um, all of them that children's museums really are about children and right. families and, and audience is, is first. Um, science centers have a slightly different mission in the sense that their, their goal is to educate the broader public about science. Right. Um, so I would say that our philosophy is, is that we're really about children and we're about parents. And science is a tool for us to inspire their natural creativity and curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, we want everybody to grow up comfortable and familiar with science, but we're not trying to teach how science. science how science works. Right. Yeah, the skills of the skills of scientists of, of you know observation and drawing inference and experimenting and collecting data and 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 trying to explain the world around them. I mean, that's a skill set that's valuable in every field. Um, and at every so, age. You know, and at every age. So, you know, first and foremost, we're, we're about kids and their parents, and that's really what, what drives us. Uh, our, our, we, we start with the philosophy that every child is naturally creative and naturally curious. And our goal is not, is not to train them how to do that. It's to, it's to foster and support that. I mean, the, the, the great quote about, about learning not being about lighting fires, but really fanning the embers. I mean, we're, we're in the business of fanning embers. And how do you cultivate um, a, a interest in the institution and in the experience? Because once a child comes the first time, the second time, the third time, uh, the institutions can tend to become boring mm -hmm. to the child. They, they're familiar. Or there is an opportunity to make the institution more interesting because as the institution becomes familiar, it becomes safe and more exploration uh, can be undertaken. How do you end up with the latter result as opposed to the former result where one or two visits then sort of... So I worry less about the um, child becoming bored and, and wanting to go and do something. And I worry more about the parents. The parents. I think the parents are our bigger challenge on that because they, you know, once they've seen it, they've done it, they, they think, oh, okay, my kid's done this. In fact, kids, appreciate the fact that, that they're, they're developing mastery. So something they couldn't do this time, they can do the next time. And kids ap appreciate the fact, the familiar, and the opportunity to repeat activities. Um, so our biggest challenge is not keeping kids excited about coming back, um, but rather keeping parents excited about supporting what's sort of natural child development, uh, particularly in the earliest years. Right. 
obviously the kinds of things you're, you're suggesting are, are, are true as kids get eight, nine, ten years old. Right. And then it becomes even more of an issue of competing activities than it does um, you know, boredom with the museum, per se. So how do you keep parents engaged? So the, the key to keeping parents engaged is, is to begin, and I think we're only starting to work on this, and I think this is a field-wide issue, to begin to help parents appreciate the development and observe what, what, their, what their children are doing and learning, and to see those milestones that they're passing, and to see the activities that they can do this time that they weren't doing last time, or the quality of the questions they're asking, or how they're probing deeper on the on the type of uh, exhibits they're exploring. Are you trying to uh, impart to the parents in some of your programs um, education in and of itself as to how their children might be learning? Yeah. It's exactly exactly the challenge. And I, I wouldn't say that we've mastered that yet. I think it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for our field. Mm -hmm. um, you have people in a in museum going is primarily a social experience. Right. Um, they're there to enjoy themselves. They're there to have fun. So the message is about what your parents are learning and how, or what your children are learning and how that's part of their development has to be a little bit more built into the exhibit and built into the experience. Often you can achieve it by getting your staff to begin to ask probing questions of the parents of, or make comments about how interesting it is what, the, what their, that their son or daughter is doing. So what does your staff look like and what does your operation look like, your budget? Well, we're pretty on? small. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, um, we've been growing, but we're a $1.3 million organization. Um, we have 12 full-time staff and about 50 or 60 part-time folks, and we have upwards of 100 volunteers. Many of our volunteers are um, high schoolers mm -hmm. uh, or early college goers, uh, although we're progressively seeing um, more retired folks come back and, and be volunteers as well. And so there are, there are a wide variety of folks, uh, mostly people who are interested in children and science, um, but folks who have a, a, an interest in sort of engaging with people and talking to them, and, and that's sort of our major, our main criteria for hiring someone. And you had, you had said that you're going to now be undertaking an expansion? Right. So we've been in, in the same two buildings mm -hmm. um, for um, 30 years. Um, the children's building uh, ha is only holds 84 people. It needs to be larger. Um, and we have this challenge of people who come with older children and younger children and, and having these sort of somewhat distinct experiences. So we're going to combine our, our, build, our resources into one building, make the visitor experience easier, double the amount of exhibit space that we have, um, we're, very, we're very crowded on, on busy times. It'll give us more opportunity. And most importantly, we have, we're in a very fortunate situation. We have four and a half acres, and we have an adjoining 180 acres of um, conservation land. And we believe that all of the issues facing children around uh, nature deficit disorder with uh, social and emotional issues that have arisen and childhood obesity issues can be in part addressed by rekindling in them and in their parents a love of the outdoors and outdoor play and exploration. So the, the 180 uh, acres that are adjacent, that will, that you can actually utilize it's an extension of the... It's going to become a, a virtual part of, um, uh, of, of the museum property. Yeah, we're, it's, it's town-owned conservation land. Uh -huh. uh, we're forming a partnership with the conservation folks in town and they are excited that we would begin to program and activate uh, this conservation land. And that could be a significant change for your operating infrastructure, your cost structures, uh, your staffing. Um, how do you avoid uh, taking steps today that look wonderful and exciting and fantastic and then moving into the unknown, the financial unknown, in right. which so many organizations down the road find themselves um, having to try to figure out how to support an operating infrastructure that is not supported by any endowment or any experience previously. So I guess one of the, one of the advantages of having the strange background that I have and having spent all the, the years in, in, in budgeting is that I'm, I'm used to developing multi-year financial models. Right. And so we've developed a pretty, I think, rigorous business plan that takes us well out past the expansion 
that looks at all the kinds of issues you're talking about. What are going to be the costs for operating larger space and an outdoor space? But also, what are the potential revenue streams? Right. Um, and you know, and then you make a series of assumptions about that. And we've been relatively cautious in our assumptions. We, you know, we're we're basing our model on, a, on only a 20 percent uh, increase in attendance. Um, you know, a, a fairly modest increase in revenue, and, and frankly, I think we can exceed all of those. But our financial model is based on fairly conservative assumptions. And your revenue mix right now for your budget, is that, uh, how much of that is earned and how much of that is contributed on an annual basis? Right. So we're, we're um, about 78% earned revenue, uh, which is a mix of admissions, membership, and the Discovery Museums is fairly unusual in that we have a very large um, school education program that goes into schools. Um, we were in 1,100 classrooms last mm -hmm. year, served 26,000 students with a program called Traveling Science Workshops that brings hands-on science into elementary school classrooms. So it's actually 15% of our, our budget is, is from, from that program itself. So there's that 78% and then 22% right. um, earned or uh, uh, um, support income from, uh, from donors and, and grants. So 78%, so 78% uh, earned is, is, is quite a, a good number. As you expand, are you going to have to shift your, um, your, um, your model by increasing, for example, admissions fees? You were talking about um, your concern about uh, ensuring that these institutions are accessible, people with, with limited means. Mm -hmm. Uh, communities that perhaps don't traditionally uh, attend museums and of course admissions fees uh, offers a pretty significant impediment. Right. Are you going to have to make any adjustments in that area or have you? Well we've, ar we've already made a number of adjustments in that area. Uh, so we've done both. We have increased our admissions fees mm -hmm. and we've increased our commitment to free and supported visitation. So um, in the last two years We've gone from 23,000 people who visited um, either free or highly subsidized to 38,000 people. 38,000 of your total of visitation, which is 165. Right. That's that's quite considerable. So you've had a considerable increase. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's sort. it's something that that I'm committed to. It's, it's something that our board is committed to. It's something the staff believe in. Um, so people are very generous in helping support that that kind of program. But we also have a you know fundamental philosophy is you know price should never be a barrier. Right. Um, you know the the admission staff is instructed that for anybody for whom it's a problem, it's not a problem. Uh, we make it not one, um, and we take it fairly seriously. But I, I but I must say you know a lot of the challenges of people visiting museums go beyond economics, and I think finding ways that you reach other communities, um, non traditional audiences is really important and, and we've taken some steps in those areas as well. You had previously mentioned the partnerships that uh, were undertaken by the Boston Children's Museums with the school system. Is, is that kind of sensibility informing your work now at the Discovery? Uh, absolutely. I think the, um, one of the challenges is that many people think of the schools as, as the education place and yet uh, we, we tend to underinvest in important parts of the schools like sciences. And in Massachusetts, even among the best school systems, um, there's very little science being taught in the elementary grades. Yes. So we work with schools throughout uh, eastern Massachusetts, uh, in fact, I think in, in 80 different towns, uh, to provide a, a program called Traveling Science Workshops, which brings real teachers into the classroom. We do hands-on science with classroom-sized folks. Um, and the, the motivation there is, is really to work with the teachers to help support what they're doing uh, and, how, and their challenges in getting real hands-on science with their children. Um, and it helps support their work day to day as they try to work through uh, the, the limited amount of science that's left in the curriculum. So through these cooperative efforts, you get to leverage the investment of not only your donors, but also those people who are um, who are supporting you through your earned income model to help the schools, right. to help yourself. It, it, it seems to be one of those uh, wonderful win-win 
uh, approaches that, that benefit every, everyone. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a ma marvelous example of how you can use uh, the work that we do in school systems that have more opportunity to pay. Right. And we're, we're able to use the resources we make there to help support us going into school systems who have less resources. And we do uh, quite a bit of grant making as well to help support that, uh, those kinds of efforts. Now, Gordon, it, it will be just fascinating to watch how this unfolds. We're right. very excited to see how your capital campaign glides into to, uh, the achievement of your goals, to see the new building being conceived, to see this, um, this approach of, of bringing children outdoors again into the 180 uh, acres. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, and thank you for your insights. Thank you, Martin.